Hello and welcome to my show. My name is Farida Hamid. The world average of female airline pilots is just over 5%. This means that for every 20 flights that we take, only one is piloted by a woman. That is why today's guest is so rare and special. She is Royal Brunei Airlines Captain Zarina Hashim. In 2012, Captain Zarina made history when she became the first female captain of any national carrier in Southeast Asia. In 2013, she piloted the first Royal Brunei Dreamliner 787 to fly out of London's Heathrow Airport. Her achievements since have included piloting a Boeing 787 Dreamliner in 2016 from Brunei to Jeddah for Brunei's National Day. That flight was significant for two reasons. It had an all-female cockpit crew and landed in Saudi Arabia, a country where at that time, women were banned from driving a car. Zarina and I met in 2014 when we were both speakers at the Women's Executive Roundtable session organized by the Civil Service Institute of Brunei. We've stayed in touch and visited with each other a couple of times and now we are finally doing this show together. Uh, welcome to the show, Zarina. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here finally. Yeah, we were supposed to record the show last week, but something happened. Do you want to share with our viewers what actually happened? <laughs> Yes, yeah, so um, we had planned, yeah, you're right, last week. And actually on the day that we were meant to do it, um, I, I got a little bit of a scare. So that day was a Saturday, was it? Was it meant to be Saturday? Yeah, yes, Saturday. I think Saturday. So the Tuesday before that, uh, Tuesday that week, I had done a flight to Hong Kong. And um, on Saturday, we had found out that one of the cabin crew um, unfortunately was a positive COVID case. So initially when we were told that we thought, okay, so who is this crew? Because if, if this crew happened to be um, serving passengers in economy, then we would have been okay. You know, we thought, okay, that um, there was no, there was no chance of close contact. And then to cut a long story short, uh, we found out, no, <laughs> this guy, um, this cabin crew was actually the one who was in the front, who actually served our meals and our drinks. So I was, I, I panicked slightly. And, uh, you know, we, we knew immediately we were going to be issued quarantine orders and things like that and messages to go get swabbed. So that day wasn't a really good day to have this interview because I wasn't in, in the right state frame of mind. Um, I did, however, go to get my swab and then um, less than 12 hours later, you know, alhamdulillah, thankfully it was, it was negative. So that's my first swab, but now I'm in quarantine and um, I've got a second swab to do next Friday. So hopefully, you know, fingers crossed that goes well. Okay, fanta fantastic. So what is the current COVID situation in Brunei? Well, obviously COVID hit towards the end of 2019 was it yeah, yeah God, it's, early, it's been so long um, well, early early uh, march 2020 actually was yes March. yeah yeah 20 end of 2019 was when um i think it started in wuhan or uh which is why for covid 19 and then um i remember early last year you know we we had already started taking precautions when we were flying and things like that and we still hadn't had any cases in brunei so March, you're right, March was the first time we actually had a positive case in Brunei. And that didn't escalate uh, greatly. We, we were very lucky. They managed to contain the spread and um, we actually went through about 458 days of no local cases wow. until yeah. earlier this month. Earlier this month, um, we had one positive case and then through all the contact tracing, um, the numbers have just grown exponentially. You know, it's, it's, it's actually worrying. Um, they've confirmed that it is the Delta variant. So uh, we've, we're sort of in a semi-lockdown now where we're only allowed to go out for essentials and only two people at a time, 
you know, going to the supermarket and things like that. It's still not, you know, I've, I've, I've heard of what's happened, you know, around the world and the, the total lockdowns and things like that. Uh, we're still not at that stage, hopefully won't be. Um, but we've been so blessed with this 458 days of uh, no, no local cases. But I think personally, I think, you know, the world, we're just going to have to accept it. You know, COVID's not going to go away for anytime soon. You know, everyone just needs to get vaccinated. And um, I think everyone's yeah. still trying to fly, though, you know. Oh, my God, yes. We're all missing it so much. So much. And, you know, even trying to plan holidays, we, we, we want to be realistic, but we also so desperately miss it. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, even for me personally, even though I still fly, you know, thankfully for work, it's not the same. I can't go down to the terminal. I'm stuck in the airplane. Um, and even when I do go to Singapore for training, you know, we're, we're confined to our hotels and, the, and just the simulator. So we're not really able, we don't have that flexibility to, you know, go out, um, go shopping. And I remember the first time after COVID started, uh, I think it was October last year, end of October last year, and I did my first trip to Singapore for training. Now that we were, we were fairly lucky because you know things were under control and they let us just go out for essentials. And uh, the hotel where we were staying at is attached to this shopping mall. So I only went down there. I didn't, I didn't venture out very far. And to be able, it, it was empty, uh, to be honest. And, but just to be able to walk around the shops and window shopping you know, and things like that, I just, I just missed it and I still miss it now. Um, so I can't imagine how everyone else is feeling where you really can't get on a plane to go anywhere, you know? I, I wonder if you could share with, with uh, the viewers. I remember we were talking about it um, when, you know, I think a couple of months ago, maybe last year, when you actually did an evacuation flight for Malaysians and I'm not sure whether it's Malaysians and Bruneians, but you got them out of somewhere. I can't remember. Yes, yes, yes. It was Cairo. Cairo. I think it was, yes. was it March? When, yeah, when COVID started? Yeah. Yeah, when, 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 people, when um, countries started closing their borders, right? Yes, yeah. I remember that. So um, we had closed our borders and our flights had been cancelled and there was no flying. So I remember um, telling management that, you know, oh, if there's any flights, you know, cargo flights or rescue flights or anything like that, um, I'm, I'm more than willing to help. So there was this, Cairo flight, which I had heard about that they were planning on doing. And I thought, oh, you know, I put up my hand. It's like, let me go. I want to go. Uh, one, because I'd never been to Cairo. <laughs> and, and another, it was just at that time when COVID hit the world, you just felt like you need, you wanted to be able to contribute, you know, in some way. And I didn't know how as a pilot, you know, what do I know? I just know how to fly a plane. So these rescue flights is all really we can do, right? So um, I remember putting up my hand for that. And thankfully, I, I, I was given the flight. And it was to bring home uh, Bruneians. And I also remember at the time, um, Brunei and Malaysia were talking. So we managed to bring home um, a lot of Malaysians as well. And uh, I think how it worked was they did a airplane to airplane transfer. So when we got to Brunei, all they did was they got off the plane and got on the um, Malaysian Airlines and flew back. Home. So was it a full flight? It was, yeah. We were very lucky though, because, uh, because we were heavy crew, meaning there was a lot of us, because it was a, oh, it must have been about a 10 hour flight or more, more than 10 hours. And, um, and it was a return. So we, you know, we, we couldn't stay in Cairo. We were there for a few hours, I think, just to wait for the passengers. Um, and then we had to fly immediately back. So because of that, uh, as the crew, the pilots and cabin crew both, we need to rest. So um, we managed to close off the business class and that was just used mainly for crew, just for us to rest. But economy was packed, it was full full of um, Bruneians and Malaysians. Right. So tell me now that it's been about what almost, well, one and a half years, almost yeah. two years that we've all gone through this. 
Um, are you back to flying a bit more regularly? And what is happening? Because I mean, I know the whole travel industry is has been totally disrupted. Nobody yeah. is going to be. Nobody is able to tell us when we can even expect that it will have some level of normalcy. So yeah. how how are you looking at your career and like um, you know where is your career moving or have you thought about what the future may hold for you as a pilot? Okay, I'll start from the beginning. Actually, initially, I remember, you know, everyone was so concerned about, oh, you know, what's going to happen to us? Are we going to still be flying? Are we going to lose our jobs? And, you know, this global pandemic has hit not just the aviation industry, travel industry, all sorts of industries, you know, basically it's affected everyone. Um, the aviation industry, as you, as you rightly said, you know, flights have been canceled. At one point, we were only 5% uh, operations. So, you know, if you think of our number, number of flights, we were down to 5% of operations. That was, that was just unheard of. We never thought that, you know, we'd ever see that. Um, so last year, I was lucky to see a flight once a month. Um, they sort of, they managed to give me a flight just to keep me current. So current in terms of recent. So basically, as a pilot, in order to remain recent, I need to do three takeoffs and three landings within 90 days. So if I lapse that 90 days, then, you know, all sorts of things I have to either fly with a training captain or I have to go into the simulator with training, things like that. This three in 90 days is very important um, for pilots to be able to fly. Um, so once a month, I was, I was lucky. And I think my first flight was July, I think last year, you know, after, after March. So from March to July, yeah, I did the, I did the, um, Cairo rescue flight, and I did a few cargo flights to China. That was good. But the first commercial flight I did was, I think it was in July. But anyway, since then, um, like I said, I've been doing flights once a month. And then earlier, no, it was actually the end of last year, I was offered this opportunity to take up a position in management. It was a temporary sort of opportunity. And initially, I was quite hesitant. Now, when I look back, the only reason I was hesitant was because I was very comfortable, you know, being at home, flying once a month, you know, who wouldn't like that, right? You know, and then Brunei was COVID free. So it was, it was kind of leading a very semi-retired life. You know, I'm sorry to say, but that's just how it felt. So I was, um, I was very hesitant to accept the opportunity. But um, I had the support, obviously, from my husband, and I spoke to family about it. And um, my mom was a little bit, she, she kind of said, okay, go for it. But at the same time, she, she kind of liked having me at home, you know, her companion. And, uh, you know, I, because I take her out uh, walking every other morning and things like that. Anyway, so um, I kind of took the bull by the horns and I thought, okay, I'll do this, right? Now, initially, the sort of, I was given until September. So it was supposed to be from January, beginning of this year till September. And um, I managed to compromise with my then boss, um, our chief pilot. And he, he said, okay, let's, let's take it to the end of March and then we'll see how you feel. If you think, you know, you can... You, you, you like it, then you can stay. If not, you know, uh, maybe, maybe it's not for you. So I, I started 31st of December last year. And um, I was there for about four months in the office in a management position as the assistant chief pilot, which is really the fleet manager. So basically the manager who manages um, all the 787 pilots, basically. And just the day-to-day -day operations of um, the, the operational side of flying, basically. Okay. And I thoroughly enjoyed it. I really, really, really enjoyed it. If you ask anyone or if anyone asks me, you know, how did you find working in the office? And when I, whenever I speak 
you know, positively about it. And I say, I really, really enjoyed it. They can't believe me. They, they think there's something wrong with me, you know, because they think who can, who enjoys being in the office? Yeah, from, but, flying, but, from flying the skies to, to sitting yeah, in the office. Exactly. But I was, I really enjoy participating, you know, being involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Um, you know, I basically to ensure that the pilots were, um, you know, following our SOPs and getting the notices out there, informing the pilots that, oh, you know, this, this and this is happening in this country. So we got, we have to do this and this, you know, and just that participation, daily participation. I really, really, really enjoyed it. So then um, the stint was cut short, um, sad to say. <laughs> uh, so I was in the office until end of April. That was because there was, you know, some organizational changes. And basically I wasn't really needed uh, anymore in the office. Um, although even, even until today, I still participate voluntarily. So if there's anything they need, um, I'll, I'll do the work for them. But anyhow, after sort of towards the end of April, towards the end of my stint in management, I was offered an opportunity in training, in the training department. So um, I applied basically to become a training captain. So uh, I'm now a, a, a line captain. So I fly with first officers and, and I just do the normal like daily flights. Well, the, the normal commercial flights uh, or any flights really. But as a training captain, I will now train other pilots. I will, I will train them to proficiency. I will check them to make sure that um, they are operating to SOPs and things like that. So it was a huge opportunity, which I couldn't turn down really. And I'd always been interested in training um, because I think that was just, I won't say natural progression, but it was something that I had always had an interest for, you know, so. When you say training, um, is this simulation or you're actually on the flight with them? That's actually another story when you say simulation, <laughs> I'll get to it. So um, it's actually training, the opportunity was for training like on the flight. So if, if someone comes, uh, a brand new pilot, uh, he will initially start in the simulator and then, you know, he, he passes and everything and he can now uh, fly the airplane. So I now train this particular pilot to um, operate according to our SOPs, basically. But because we don't have any new pilots at the moment, it's just uh, retraining like the guys now because everyone's so inactive in flying. So it'll be retraining and just checking that um, everyone's proficient and, you know, still doing the right thing. So we're going back to this whole simulation thing. <laughs> So I had applied for this training position and um, I went for the interview and everything went well. Uh, then you there was this- You interviewed Zarina, you've made history. And they still <laughs> interview you. Yes, basically they needed to see whether I had the ability to instruct. Ah, to train so somebody yeah, else. Yes, yes, to train, yes, yes. yes exactly. Well, so yeah, I can a different skill like, set there. Patience. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is what I'm learning. So going back to that simulation. Now, this is a bit of a long story. So I'll try to keep it as short as possible. How it works in our airline is when you become a training captain, right? You, what they do is you'll, you'll only be able to train first officers. So I now sit in the left-hand seat as a captain. Okay, so for the first six months, I will only be able to train or instruct from the left hand seat. Now, after six months, they then check me to be able to train or instruct from both seats, the left and the right. Mm -hmm. okay. So then, uh, so then that will take, you know, maybe after about a year. So if COVID wasn't happening, say a year and a half to two years, then they would send me to um, train or to learn to instruct in the simulator so i can then um instruct brand new pilots who don't know how to fly a 787 i can teach them in the simulator so that's that's how normally it would pan out okay you you become a trainer takes about one and a half to two years and then you then learn to teach in 
teach or instruct in the simulator? Uh, did I ever tell you I've, I've been in a simulator? Have I you? I told you that story, yeah. I, I knew someone from one of the airlines in Malaysia, I won't name. And so he gave me a, um, a what did you call it? He took me to the simulator because I was there to visit for something. And he said, oh, would okay. you like to try the simulator? And I said, yes, absolutely. And so I went which, to the- Wait, 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 hang on. Which airplane was it? I, Can you oh, remember? Gosh, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know the type of airplane. But anyway, he called okay. the, one of the captains who was around and the captain who actually teaches the simulation, you know? And so I got to sit on the, on the, on the, on the passenger side of the, like a co-pilot side. Yep, yep, yes. And, oh my God, it was, it was fascinating, but quite terrifying for me at the same time. So did you actually fly the simulator? No, no, I didn't. I was sitting in the okay. passenger seat, but, I, but if I'm okay. not mistaken, they were simulating like an emergency landing and I was okay. freaking out. So I was like, yeah. stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so real, but it was fascinating to see how real it was. It feels and it sounds in inside the cockpit, you know, during a simulation. Yes. So yes, that's absolutely really fascinating. But where has been your first commercial flight um, since all this has happened? Uh, the first one was in July um, to Melbourne. Uh, okay. I think yes, it was Melbourne, and I actually I actually posted about it um, on my Instagram, and um, I was so happy to be back to flying. Uh, not just a cargo or a rescue flight. Um, so, yeah, it was to Melbourne. And I remember being really nervous, really, really, really nervous because, you know, I hadn't, I wasn't regularly flying. Um, but amazingly, it, it's like the motor skills just kicked in, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and, and I, you know, I, I don't want to say it's like riding a bicycle because it's not, it's not like riding a bicycle, but um, it, it comes back to you really fast, actually, really quickly. Um, so that was really good. Uh, so so yeah. what we were talking about this before we came on air, and I thought you shared some, something very interesting. And I kind of stopped you and said, no, talk about it when we do the interview, because that's such an okay. interesting point. And we were talking about what you learned about yourself um, because you've had all this time, like all of us have had time to kind of slow down and be more introspective mm. and, you know, just think about all that's happened and where we are in our lives. So what have you yes. learned about yourself during COVID? Okay, this is actually really important. And, and to be honest, it took me a year to realize that confidence diminishes. It really, really does. Um, I'm, I would like to believe, and honestly, I've, I've always thought that I'm not an uh, underconfident person. You know, I'm very confident, um, which is why I do what I do, uh, which is how I got to where I am today. You know, I'm a very confident person. Um, I, don't, I don't believe that I, I um, lack self-confidence, but then because uh, of COVID and all this lack of flying, you know, I, I really learned that confidence really diminishes, you know, self-belief and self-belief is so important, you know, to be able to do anything. And it was only sort of highlighted to me. And I only realized this again, going back to your first question with this opportunity into training, um, because, uh, Remember how I said it takes two years to become an instructor in the simulator? So basically, yeah, so I was actually given that opportunity to do first. I was fast-tracked. So I did that in July. And no, uh, yes, two week, the first two weeks of July, I was sent someone with no trading experience, takes two years to become an instructor in the simulator, and they sent me. Um, to the simulator to learn how to instruct in the simulator. Okay, so I was fast tracked. So it was then that I realized, or someone made me realize that um, I had lost my confidence, you know, because I was given that opportunity and I thought, oh, you know what? I said, really, this is so much, so much you're asking of me. You know, this is something that takes um, a normal pilot who wants to go into training, it takes them two years to reach this, this point in their career. But you, 
you are now asking me to do it in two weeks, you know? Um, so I was, I was really, I had lost that confidence, my, the, the belief in myself. So I was lucky enough to meet someone. Uh, he was actually the instructor on my course. Uh, bless him. I, we hit it off immediately, you know, and I, I love him to bits. I still message him from time to time. He's gone back home to the UK. And um, he sort of running up to the point when I went to Singapore for my training, he, he was always messaging me or emailing me and kind of sending me um, like bits and pieces. Like he sent me a clip about, um, do you remember that movie, um, Hidden Figures? Yes. A great movie. Yes. So he sent me a clip about that. You know, basically he was trying to, um, instill this self-belief he was trying to get me to believe in myself again and he kept saying and saying to me you know believe in yourself believe you can do it you know you can do it I know you can do it you have to know you can do it so it took me a year to realize and I, I have learned that confidence really really diminishes and it takes a lot to bring it back it didn't take long because uh, I remember before I left Brunei, he said to me, he said, you'll get there. He said, your, your confidence will get back. And when you have it back, I will tell you. And I think it was a few days with him in Singapore. And just like that, it was, it was back. You know, my, my be the belief in myself, you know, and, he, and at the end of the course, he said, it was, it, was, um, it was amazing to see. He said how I was so... Um, and the confident when I arrived, you know, I was, I wasn't sure whether I would be able to do it. And, you know, two weeks with him, and then we got through the course, you know, I passed my assessment of competence. And he said to see the smile on your face, you know, he was, it was very satisfying for him as an instructor, you know, because he was the one who brought me through the course. Um, so on my journey into training now, this is what I'm looking forward to, you know, this is, this is what I want, I want to be able to, um, encourage people, inspire people, motivate people to instill this confidence because at the end of the day, I want to see that smile on their face. Yeah. You know? I, think, I think that's a really important point because in the work that I do, which is a lot on leadership and communication, um, the number one challenge that I hear, and this is primarily from women, is the, you know, the imposter syndrome or the self-doubt oh, yeah. that sometimes will pop up. And these are high achieving women in general, right? Yeah. Yes. And I think it's so important that you're speaking about it because it, you know, we can be high achievers, but we are human too. And we yes. have, it's not like you're constantly having self-doubt. We have moments of self-doubt. And that's yeah. a very natural thing. I mean, we wouldn't be human if we didn't have those moments of self-doubt. I kind of look at it as when you're having that moment of self-doubt, it means you're growing. Because yeah. otherwise, if you're not having and you're super you know, confident, uh, because confidence has got a dark side as well, it's, you're also in your comfort yeah. zone. You've been doing something yeah. the same way for so long. Um, and in your case, particularly with all the accolades and the achievements and all of that, it would have been easier to actually just do what comes probably very naturally for you now. And for you to go and try something that, is different. Uh, you've never tried before, and you know all the other skills that come with that, the non-technical skills that come with mm. that. Um, which yeah. kind of segues into the next point I wanted to ask you. Um, when you're a when you're when you're captaining a flight, um, mm. you are basically the leader of the flight. Mm. Um, you know, three hundred lives um, are at your are, are depending on you basically for the decisions that you make. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of pressure because, you know, most of us are not, you know, uh, not having to deal with that kind of pressure where lives are in our hands, unless you're a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon or any kind of a surgeon. So tell me what you have learned about leadership, Zarina. Well, just speaking about, you know, that heavy burden on the shoulder, you know, it, it, it really, really is. And to be honest, if I were to dwell on it, you know, to think about the lives that are in my hands and things like that. I, <laughs> I don't think I'd, I'd get off the ground, to be honest, you know, but I need to believe in my ability uh, to be able to um, operate the airplane and transport these passengers safely from A to B. So in terms of what I've learned 
um, about leadership or what leadership means to me. You know, it's about um, being able to lead my team. And my team would involve uh, my first officer or my co-pilot, uh, the, the cabin crew involved, because we have a goal. You know, we have, a, our goal is to get the passengers safely from A to B. So um, as a leader, I want to, you know, inspire people and I want them to, it, it's, it's not about authority. It's not about authority at all. You know, I want everyone to work together towards this common goal. So it's not just the airplane or the, the flight itself, you know, our goal from A to B, but also in terms of the company's goal, you know, we've got as an airline. Um, so I've been given that position as captain of the flight, you know, as a leader of the team of the flight um, to not just carry out um, our team goals, but also the company's goals, you know, and, it, and it's all about getting people to work together you know, being open to um, anything anyone really wants to say to you. I mean, and, and it's not just the team, but it's even the passengers. You know, if, if the passengers see something which they're not happy with, then by all means, tell us, you know, because if, if you don't tell us, we're not going to know. I'm only looking out the front. Um, my eyes behind that closed cockpit door is the cabin crew and the passengers. That's it. So if no one voices out their concerns, you know, we're not going to know. So I think really leadership is all about uh, working together as a team. So that, that dives in quite well with my next question because, and you kind of alluded to it just now, where does communication play in, in all of that? Because a lot of your communication is technical. That means there's a lot of communication yeah. with the tower, with the, you know, whatever buttons. <laughs> I don't know what you yeah. call them, those sort of, you know, the many buttons you have on your, uh, at, at the flight deck. Um, yes. But that very human connection with your team. Um, and I have a question later about communication with passengers as well. Okay. Um, but how, how do you manage around communication? And are there parts of it that you still uh, would like to improve? Oh, yeah, a lot. Um, so really communication, um, it's, especially in, in my line of work, it's not just verbal. Right? It's not verbal, it's, 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 it's also written, it's also non-verbal. Um, so when we talk about the verbal communication, um, you know, we want to be able to get our message across clearly. And we, we need to also be able to confirm that the message that we had passed across you know, has been understood. You know, there's no point in saying something and you know, the guy just doesn't understand. So we even have our procedures to, for example, if there was an emergency, right? Now, obviously emergencies would cause panic, um, but we have put procedures in place so that you know, we remain calm. And then, for example, as I, I mentioned about what happens behind the closed flight deck door, you know, we don't know unless we're told. So if something were to happen and the cabin crew were to come in and tell us what, were, what, what happened, we then have a procedure to um, give them a brief, okay, to basically say, right, this is what has happened, this is what we're going to do, and this is how long it's going to take. And what do you need to prepare in the cabin, uh, anything special for the emergency um, that you've, you've talked about. So at the same time, the crew will have to repeat exactly what I tell them. Okay. Because that's the only way we can get feedback to, to, to know that you know, they understand or they have, they have heard what, um, what I've, I've just told them. You know? So that's like speaking verbally. Um, when it comes to nonverbal, you know, um, I will fly with the first officer. I have to, I need to be able to recognize whether he may not, if he's unhappy about something, he or she is unhappy about something, he or she might not say, right? But you'll be able to see it in the body language, you know? But I always, I, I will always, always tell the guy or the girl that, you know, if you are unhappy, please say so. Um, because I'm not a mind reader. Yeah, I, I might be able to kind of, I have an inkling or oh, something's not right. He's, you know, she's not happy about something. 
right? And then I ask. But from the get-go, I will always um, encourage all my team to be very open. You know, um, they, they, they don't be afraid to voice out anything, any concerns whatsoever. Um, if you see I'm doing something wrong, then say so. Right. You know? And, and I think that's, um, really, that's really important, whether you're flying a plane or you're doing a normal corporate work as well. Because ultimately, as you said, I mean, I like to use the analogy of flying a plane. I mean, everything has to be aligned, right? Everything has to be working yes. uh, towards that one goal. Um, and so flying a plane really is a good analogy to that. Now, that brings me to my next question. Um, years ago, when we were having a chat, I remember you told me a yeah. funny story about, um, you know how, because there's so few women pilots or women captains, uh, it's not very common to hear, you know, when you get on the flight and you're buckling, buckled in, and then, you know, the yeah. captain will say, uh, good afternoon, this is, you know, captain, whatever. And yep. to hear a woman, like for you to say, good, good afternoon, this is Captain Zarina. Um, mm. What kind of reactions have you gotten? And, you know, ones that's, Re, that we, you remember that stick in your mind about the reactions that people have had when they've heard a female voice come over that uh, microphone? Well, it'd be a lie to say there haven't been any negative comments. There have. But again, that was very long time ago. And I think people have gotten used to the fact that uh, if you're a flyer or Brunei, you know, uh, we have it. Um, but everyone's been so positive. And it doesn't start just in the when you get get on the plane. You know, actually, when you're at the gate, I mean, we just a recent one actually. Um, I, I was doing a Singapore flight, and our ground staff, um, uh, bless her, I love her to bits, and you know, she's she's very proud of um, the female pilots in Brunei, and I think she she was already you know telling the passengers, oh you know, your, your captain today is female, you know, and she's a lady pilot, you know. Um, so they, they always, uh, initially, they probably, it's probably disbelief. No, you know, it can't be, you know. And then he was, and she'd always be like, oh, yes, it is, you know, you can see out the window. And, you know, when, when, the, when the airplane is parked, right, at the gate, sometimes if you're at the gate, you can see out. So they look out and, um, but with any passenger, really, you know, when they hear it's a female, it's, it's always very positive. You know, most of the time, it's always, always positive. Okay, that's, that's so uh, refreshing to hear because I remember when you told me the story once and I think this probably was early, early Which on. one was it? Eh? Uh, this, this was about some guy who uh, got up and said uh, he didn't want to, to, to be on a flight with a female um, pilot and he was very unhappy about it. This was long, early on. And we met in 2014, so it must have happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, uh, either just before that or you, yeah, maybe one or two years before I that. I do remember one, um, and it was a guy, and I mean, oh my God, when I think about it, it was actually after the flight, okay? And uh, he commented that uh, when he saw me, he was like, oh, it was a female pilot. No wonder it was turbulent. And I'm like, oh, are, you, are you serious? Can you? Is he that said even that a, to you? To he you? He said that to me. He said that to me. Um, you know, he said it jokingly, obviously. But at the same time, you think, is that even an educated comment to make? Yeah. You yeah, know. Yeah. Does the pilot have anything to do with turbulence? You know, we. We have no control about what what happens with the you know the air the air density and you know things like that we we yeah. can't control it we can only make it try to make it as comfortable as possible for the passengers you know but but, but I mean, overall you've not really I mean now I think people are very used to it they probably celebrate the fact that they have a female captain piloting they do they do yeah it's um it's it's very it's really really lovely to see. So Zarina, we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, so people okay. get to know kind of, you know, behind the scenes, Zarina. Okay. Um, what, what do the first 60 minutes of your day normally look like? Like, what, what do you have habits or rituals that you have been practicing for a long time? Um, to be honest, <laughs> the start of my day is not very interesting. But uh, I'll talk about, it actually changes a lot. You know, I'll go through these routines uh, but my current routine, but the one thing that hasn't changed uh, for a long while now is uh, obviously morning prayers, 
right? The sumo prayers, that will take up about 20 minutes. So that, that doesn't change. But what happens after that? I've noticed um, it changes. You know, I used to be someone who needed to have coffee first thing in the morning. But to be honest, now I haven't had coffee for over a week, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'll talk about my routine now, okay, especially, you know, during this COVID time and um, quarantine time. So earlier this year, uh, we, we had maids in, in the house because I live in quite a big household. Uh, with my brother's family, with my mother. So, and it's, it's quite a big household and we're, we're quite, um, we have our own space as well. So I'm, I'm you know, if, if I were to quarantine by myself, I'm self-sufficient actually. It's like a little, little apartment kind of thing. So we had maids and uh, earlier this year, they went home. They didn't want to stay. Uh, they, they, they've been with us for many, many years. So the maids went home and uh, because of COVID, it was really difficult to get the maid, uh, get new maids to come back or to, to come to the country. So anyway, so now my morning, um, so 20 minutes will be subo prayers. And then I'll get up and uh, make my bed because making the bed is so important. Mm -hmm. First thing in the morning, mm -hmm. you want to do it. Because as soon as you get that task done, it's like the start of a productive day. Yes. You know, that has never changed. Prayers and making my bed. Um, so I have to make my bed and then I'll go down and basically set up the household for the day. You know, switch off the lights, um, do the laundry and things like that. Uh, so that, that takes up a good 60 minutes. Probably 10 minutes out of that, I'll, I'll have to myself to just maybe, you know, go on uh, social media or just 10 minutes to myself. So that's your, like yourself, is that like your self-care or do you have also like a self-care routine that you do like on weekends or days that you have off? Oh, yeah. Um, self-care in terms of exercise, definitely. Um, Girly things also like, you know, have prior to COVID, like going to the spa or having a facial. Oh, yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Facials every, two to, uh, every three weeks, really. Three weeks to a month. Um, I, I miss those, actually. <laughs> I really, really miss first, those. You call it first world problems, but hey, yes. sometimes <laughs> we have to be honest about the things that we miss. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, this this is a question that I like to ask uh, uh, people that come on the show uh, because yeah. I, I read it in in the Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's this famous uh, four hour work week. He wrote this book. Uh, there was a okay. and he asked this question of a lot of his guests so I'm going to ask you this as well if okay. you could put a billboard up anywhere what would it say and why that's a very interesting question now billboard I think would have to be sort of short right short and straight to the point and really catch his attention so I think personally I would um my billboard would say, self-belief is a superpower. Oh, I like that one. Yeah. Uh, I would like to see that with Zarina in a superwoman outfit. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sure a lot, of girl, a lot of young girls look up to you, but that is such an important thing. Self, could you repeat that? Self. Self-belief is a superpower. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, because it 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 shapes your confidence, this self-belief, you know? It sort of motivates you to do whatever you set your heart out on doing. Yeah. So everything starts from self-belief. Yeah, I think you, you it, it depends a lot, to, or at least to some extent, on, on the kind of environment you grew up, grew up in. Oh, yeah. But that brings me into the next question I was going to ask you, uh, when you when you talk about the billboard. Um, you did an interview where you spoke about your dad Yes. And, uh, you know, you said that he helped you believe in yourself. Um, and I'd yeah. like you to share a little bit about why or how that happened and, and uh, what it is that your dad said to you as you were a young girl. Because I'm a firm believer in the fact that the environment in which you grow up, um, yeah. of course, originally your parents and then your siblings, um, they play such a crucial role, um, particularly for a young girl. Yes, absolutely. They really, really do. You know, family, um, family, definitely. So my father, actually, he was, uh, 
he was actually quite a strict dad. You know, he, he, and he was very hard on us when it came to studies and things like that. He wasn't the kind of parent to, you know, sit down and um, make sure we do the work. Uh, I was, we were very blessed that our parents sort of trusted that we were doing the work, you know, and, and obviously it, it, um, it showed in our report cards and things like that. But um, some people might not agree on how my dad kind of looked at things, but I honestly think that it, it really, really helped me. So for example, if I had a report card, which um, had for eight subjects, right? And I got like five A's and three B's, for example. Now, as a child, you would look at that and think, oh, wow, you know, okay, my parents are going to be so proud of me. But he would look at it and he'd make like five A's on me. And you're like, oh, Asian my gosh. Parents. <laughs> yeah. Asian parents. <laughs> and it, now when I look back, it actually really helped me. Yeah, okay, I probably resented him for it, you know, but um, where, where I am now, it, it, it had a lot to do with that because that's how I am when it comes to, um, you know, anything I do or the, the studies or my studies exams I take. I don't, for example, if I get 95%, which is I, not all the time, I'm just, you know, it's just, it's just a number out there, 95%. Of course, I'm happy, but at the same time, I want to know what is that 5% that I got wrong, you know? And most people would just, you know, they're happy to see the results and they forget about it, right? But I want to know. I want to know what I got wrong, what five, that 5%, what it is that I got wrong and how I got it wrong. So I will always reflect on myself and think, oh, okay, I think that's why I answered it this way because I thought it was like this, or I was confused. You know, I need, to, I need to know. That came from my dad, I think. And also, he, when, whenever we um, were to do something, or he asked us to do something, or when it came to school, uh, and we, we would say to him, okay, daddy, I'll, I'll try my best. And he was like, no, you do not try your best. You do your best. So, I never say I try, I'll try my best. I always say I will do my best. Ah, so, I like that. Because yeah. I always spoke, I always say the words that you choose stick in your brain. Uh, it's how yeah. you communicate with yourself. Yeah. So you don't say I will try my best. I will do my best. My best. Okay. I hope the audience picks that yeah. up. What did you learn from your mom? Now, my mom. Um, she was actually, she was, a she was a registered nurse before she actually, when she had my brother as well. So, um, but she, she left and she decided to become a stay at home mom. So when, when I was around, she was already a stay at, stay at home mom. And, um, I'm very close with my mother, but she's always, told us to do what makes us happy. Um, I remember before I got married, even I, I told her, I said, mommy, I'm not going to, this is before I met my husband. So I said, I said to her, I said, mommy, I, I don't think I'm going to get married. Um, I don't want to get married. I'll just, I'll just look after you, you know? And she said to me, she's like, that's okay. She said, as long as you're happy, you know? So, but then six months later, I got married. <laughs> I could, I could just, if I could be a fly on the wall sitting on your, or sitting on your mom's shoulder, shoulder, probably what she was thinking was, yeah, well, you just wait and see. <laughs> she was just too wise to say it at that time. <laughs> so I She's a, very, very, very encouraging. You know, she supports me, uh, all, all my siblings, anything and everything we want to do. Yeah. I've had the pleasure of meeting your husband and I was very um, uh, impressed by the fact that you fly the skies and he is a deep sea diver. Yes, he Tell is. Us, I mean, that is such a unique combination. Tell us briefly what he does. Okay, he's, he's an offshore diver. So he doesn't do any of the recreational diving um, and things like that. So it, it's all commercial diving. 
And so he'll go um, offshore for most of the year. When, whenever he does a, a stint offshore, it'll be maybe four to eight weeks at a time. So what he does, he'll do, you know, construction underwater, um, inspection and things like that. And um, he initially, he was just an air diver where I think he, he, he could go up to depths of 50 meters and things like that. But um, yeah, I think 50 meters. Uh, but now he does saturation diving. So that's where oh, they... Yeah. yeah. Have you ever watched that or have you heard of that movie, um, The Last Breath? I don't think I've seen it. Okay. Well, I've, I haven't watched it because I don't want to. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, it is about um, a, a diver, basically a commercial diver. And um, I think somehow how he, he got separated from his vessel and but um the cold in the water managed to you know help him survive and it's just it's just something that i wouldn't want to watch but anyway if you know that movie that that is basically what um my husband does he does he does that deep sea diving okay yeah so it's a, sorry? sorry sorry go ahead i didn't mean to interrupt no 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 um it's so so sometimes what he does is if he'll go in a chamber and they'll pressurize him to depths of maybe 100 meters and so if I talk to him on Skype um, it'll be like talking to Donald Duck because they they breathe on helium and oxygen so he's he's like in this chamber living in a chamber for 28 days breathing on helium and oxygen what they call heliox wow. um, yeah so he's he lives um, you know at that 100 meter depth pressure for 28 days at a time Wow, that is amazing. I mean, I have a fear of heights and I have a fear of depth. And so that brings me to my next question. That's a very nice uh, <laughs> um, a lead into my next question. What, what do you still fear? So, you know, to be honest, I am afraid of heights. <laughs> really? <laughs> I don't have ever seen any interview where you said that. Pray tell. Um, because no one's ever asked me this question. Uh, so... I think it came with age more than anything. Um, Cause when I was younger, you know, when you're younger, you, you kind of live like you have nothing to lose and you know, you're, you live life to the fullest and things like that. But as you grow older, you've got so much more that you can lose. You know, you have your obligations, you have people that depend on you. So because of that, um, I think uh, that, made me sort of fear not so much heights but any situation which would endanger me you know so this whole height thing I think came with age and you know even if I see something um, like a video or um, pictures where you know someone's standing on you see even now talking about it like my my legs kind of feel a little bit like jelly <laughs> Um, but surprisingly, when I'm in the airplane, looking down, not so much. I think because, you know, I'm, I'm there kind of in, uh, I, know how to, I know how to control the airplane. Yeah. Right? So, it's, so every time now, you know, when it comes to anything to do with heights, yeah, it just, I, I feel weak, weak in the knees. <laughs> yeah, that, is um, so, that is so interesting because I, for me, you know, when I see those YouTube videos of people, you know, they're walking on that on that glass kind of oh my god you, you, the, you see, see, even now i can i can feel my, my <laughs> i'm like i will watch it for a bit and then i'm like i gotta get off it because i start having palpitations okay you know and like you when i was young because i studied in the u.s and i used to fly all the time and i never turbulence never bothered me or mm -hmm. anything mm. now i'm a little bit more every time there's turbulence i get a little bit nervous um as well so probably you've got, you probably write about saying that it's got something to do with age because of, I suppose, you know, you've got more commitments, more responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then actually, just to touch a bit more on that. So when I said things which, you know, which endanger me, so really, the, so the whole thing about heights and what you mentioned turbulence, I think my greatest fear is not being in control. Because honestly, if I'm in, in a in a plane as a passenger and there's turbulence, I'm not a very happy bunny. Really? <laughs> but in the, front, in the front, I'm okay because I'm in control of the airplane, you know? So 
I honestly think it's not being in control. So that brings me again to my next question. When you're a passenger, what seat do you what norm, what seat do you normally book? Okay. So it depends on the flight itself. Now, normally if it's a short flight, so if I were to fly to KL to Singapore, because that's only you know two hours away, um, I, I like to take the window seat. Uh, if I'm traveling alone. If I'm with my husband, I will also take the window seat. And that doesn't, it doesn't matter where I'm flying to. Um, if I'm with my husband, then I'll take the window seat. But if I'm on my own, on short sectors, I'll fly the, uh, on the, uh, I'll sit in the window seat. But if it's a long flight, I prefer to be at the aisle because then it's easier for me to get in and out if I needed to use the toilet or... Have, have you ever been on a flight where there's been some kind of emergency and they've, and they've said, is there a pilot on the flight? No, no, I haven't. You've seen, seen, movies. <laughs> you've seen <laughs> movies sometimes? No. Yeah, so no, no. Has, no, has there been any emergencies that you've ever had to deal with? Um, yeah, I mean, I know you've not had any terrorist type of emergencies, yep. but, you know, any other kind of emergencies um, that, you, you know, that you had to deal with? Yeah, well, I've been... I've been very blessed in terms of uh, having to deal with emergencies, not many. And there have been none which have been technical related, you know, anything related to the airplane, which, which made it, you know, unsafe. You know, I've been very, very, very blessed with that. Um, and I've not had to divert anyway. So basically, if I, if I set out on a day to fly to point B, Alhamdulillah, so far, I've always gotten there. I've never ended up anywhere else. Less, you know, okay, so I've been blessed in that way. Um, but I have had a couple of medical emergencies on board, but we've been, you know, we've had such a great team of cabin crew and we've had doctors on board. Um, so we've managed to deal with it in flight. But one of the ones which I can remember is uh, I had a death on board. So one of my passengers actually passed away and we were flying from Jeddah to Brunei. And halfway, we were probably over India. And um, the cabin crew said, oh, you know, we have a passenger in the back. They're giving him CPR. And we have our procedures. So we actually contact, um, basically, we, we contact doctors uh, in, in the air. And they tell us, we have a procedure where um, they will then tell us uh, what to do. And that flight, we actually didn't have a doctor on board. Um, and so the, we, we told the doctor um, on the SATCOM, which is the satellite phone. So we told them that you know the, the, the crew were doing CPR and they had used the defibrillator, but nothing, basically nothing happened. So <clears throat> he then works out that, oh, you know, you've got another five hours to go to your destination. So he actually said to us that, um, you know, you can tell your crew to to stop the CPR. Basically, he's you know the, the passenger is already gone. Um, yeah, and and I was a bit shocked because I didn't think you know we could we should stop the CPR. But then his advice was you know you've got five hours left. There is there is no point if you've been doing CPR for the past one hour, and you know there's there's not, nothing's happening. So. Uh, so yeah, that was, um, the, the rest of the flight, uh, was a non-event, you know, they, they managed to put the, uh, passenger who had passed away, um, they sort of covered him up and he was in the back, um, back row. And, um, I remember coming, arriving into Brunei on stand and we had the, uh, medical, personnel meet us you know they were uh, the, the ambulance came and then we had our um, RBA staff as well and all the passengers left and then they got this um, uh, passenger who had passed away off the airplane and um, one of our managers she came to me and uh, she gave me a big hug you know she said you know are you okay and she gave me a big hug and it was actually just then that I realized you know uh, Basically, emotions just started, it, it, you know, I, I started to tear up at the time, just when she hugged me, you know, because at the time uh, in flight, 
um, I had no time to, you know, have any have any emotions or feel sad about it. Yeah, I I felt like, oh, you know, I'm I'm so sorry for his family and things like that. But to think that it had happened on my flight, you know. Uh, so yeah, it, it's funny how um, these emotions kind of come about when you have time to yourself, and mm -hmm. especially if you get. Yes, when you decompress, yeah. and especially when you have support from someone else, and <laughs> just mm. who's been That's your favorite? Who's been your favorite passenger? Because I know you've posted some stuff on Instagram about some little kids. Um, oh yeah, I'm yeah. Wondering yeah. whether you know, I'm, I'm sure you get lots of kids come up to you. Have you had one that is sort of been the story has been so fascinating or, or so interesting about that one particular passenger? Well, to be honest, um, there hasn't really been one I mean one which is memorable was um, this one little girl who her name was Zarina as well but it was spelled uh, with a t and an s and I think I posted this on my Instagram uh, her letter she wrote to me she said her name is Zarina too but spelled differently and um, very young girl so her father I think wrote the wrote the letter and um, it was so lovely to get this message from, you know, it wasn't even my flight, I think, you know, she, I think she had just sort of heard about me. And, um, you know, so she wrote, she wrote this, this little message to me. And um, I really, really appreciate these little things, you know, I, I've, I've gotten a few messages, not many. Um, but I really, really enjoy having the children uh, come up to the flight deck. So when we get on the ground, we do encourage, you know, if, if, if there's anyone who wants to come visit, then we do it on the ground. Obviously, we can't do it in flight. So they'll come up to the flight deck and, um, you know, they'll ask questions. There was one actually quite funny. I did a little uh, a talk in one of our international schools in Brunei. So I was, I was, I was uh, talking to the children. And um, I believe some of their parents were present. So I told them, you know, the next time you get on a plane and if you hear that it's me, please come up to the front and, you know, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll show you around my office. I'll show you around the flight deck. And months later, they actually did. So this one family came, or it was a couple of families, so with their parents. And <laughs> it wasn't the children who were asking the questions, it was the parents. <laughs> <laughs> that that is the funny funny twist on your yeah. story because yeah. i think there's all of us a lot of us would like to go into the cockpit but now because i think after 9 11 we're not allowed to during yeah. a flight anymore right? yeah um and so and even yeah. i think even now with covid um it's it's yeah. not going to be very possible it's going to be really hard to do yes so a lot of young girls probably would be at least i hope will listen to this interview and um, I'd like to know what, firstly, what kind of uh, classes should they be taking if they have a dream of becoming a pilot? Like what subjects should they focus on or excel in to become a pilot? And um, what advice, what other advice would you give them? Okay, well, in terms of education, um, I think the early years or uh, you know, basic education obviously is very important. So, you know, your, your uh, language skills, so English, because English is, is the aviation language, right? So English, uh, definitely maths, um, geography, uh, just so you, you know about, you know, our, our world and how uh, things, things work in terms of like meteorology and, and you learn that in geography anyway. So that's the like the the basic side of education, and uh, even physics. When it comes to science, you know, if you if you were to take a pure science, then definitely physics, because you need to know how an airplane flies. Don't ask me what the coefficient of lift is because I can't remember. It's some <laughs> formula, <laughs> half rho v squared or something. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yes. Yeah, so I would say focus definitely English maths. Geography, hmm, it's kind of 50-50. It's good to know, but definitely English, maths, and if you were to concentrate on a pure science, physics. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you had not become a pilot, thinking back to your you know, younger days, if, mm. I mean, was, was becoming a pilot like your, your dream or did you have another dream 
when you were you know you know how when you're in school they ask you what do you want oh, yeah. to be yes, when you grow yeah. up so yeah. I mine was I wanted to be an archaeologist I wanted to wow. go to Egypt yeah I wanted to go to Egypt and uh, go to the pyramids I've never been to Egypt yet I haven't that's on my list I've never flown to uh, Egypt I'd love to go and see the pyramids but when I look back now I think even though I never got to do that um, the the connecting link really is that I'm a storyteller because you know, oh, yes. as a yes, journalist, yes, yes, yes. And, and to me, I to this day, I will watch documentaries about, you know, the pyramids and the mm. kings of old and all the stories about, you yep. know, how they how they ruled. And so there is that link. So I'm kind of curious, what did you want to be when you were a kid? Okay, as a child, when I, to be honest, I think it was first and foremost a pilot. That was the first time that I actually had an ambition. You know, when, when I actually thought of an ambition, it was pilot. But growing up, that kind of, it was like just a dream. You know, I, I never really thought that I could become a pilot. So I was very, growing up and going through school and things like that, it, I was, I didn't know what it was that I wanted to be. I did know one thing. I, and I remember telling my dad about this. Uh, I wanted to be a somebody, not anybody, a somebody, you know, someone to make a difference. And, um, and I actually even looked into accounting. I wanted to, but not just any accountant. I wanted to be a chartered accountant. So it was, it was that the ambition really was to become a somebody. If it was anything, you know, if it was going to be a doctor, I probably would have been like a surgeon. You know, I, I, would, have, I would have made sure that whatever career I had chosen, I would become a somebody in that career. So, Zarina, what's next for you? Well, at the moment, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I've, I ventured into training. So my flights actually have increased because of my training. Uh, so, and I'm, I think I'm going to be pretty busy from now on you know once I get out of quarantine already I think uh, I was I was talking to the office and how they've already uh, discussed about what my flying is going to be like because before this before the quarantine um, order I was flying twice a week and that's actually a lot oh. yeah I was doing all the 787 flights uh, which was we the 787 flights I believe oh no well not the not all um but the, the short haul flights, the Singapore flights, I was doing that, that every week, uh, twice a week. So uh, I'm pretty busy nowadays. So that's, so I think the future is uh, definitely into training. Uh, once my training is over, I then will be training others and checking others. I'm looking forward to it, actually. So before I go into our rapid fire round, which I'm, it's yeah. got a bit of fun, I got some fun questions for you. Um, can you tell us who are all dying to travel whether you have any inside information about when likely or what is the aviation industry talking about where we may be able to fly with our digital certificates do you have any inside information that you can share with us honestly i don't um because it's just there's, there's so much involved you know um i'll talk about something recent before uh, COVID, our second wave hit Brunei, we had a very good travel lane with Singapore, very, very good travel lane with Singapore. So what I used to do is I used to fly to Singapore, get swabbed on arrival. And then um, I think four or five hours later, when the, when the results came out, I was free to leave the hotel. But then obviously, because of our government restrictions and all that, you know, we weren't allowed to leave our hotel. But um, any normal person allowing uh, being allowed to travel for essential travel was yeah, as soon as they got a negative result, they were they were free to holiday in Singapore. You know, if, if they were allowed to travel, and then coming back to Brunei, um, we if within seventy two hours you take a swab before you leave. Uh, if it's negative, then you know you're free to go home. And when we go home uh, in Brunei, we were only in quarantine for two days. We take a swab. Uh, oh. It was um, it was negative, and then we're free to go home. So it's really easy, but now they've stopped that because of the second wave. And I think uh, Singapore is looking at you know uh, their different channels 
So they've started or they're going to start in September. And I think a lot of countries are going to follow suit. They call it a vac vaccination travel lane. Yes. yes. Yeah. So um, that's for Singapore is starting in September and that's good for us. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure a lot of other um, countries are going to follow suit. So all it is, if you're fully vaccinated, you have that certificate, yeah. all you need to do is present a negative swab result before travel, have another swab result when you arrive at your destination, and then you can go about your business. Mm -hmm. And then um, depending on the country you go to, they might ask you to swab you know, a second or third time, just yeah. as a precaution. Yeah. So honestly, the direction we're going in terms of travel, yes, it will happen. I don't know when. Uh, PPE, masks, I think, is going to be with us for life. Um, and, you know, swabbing, well, if you want to travel, you're just going to have to get used to it. I think that's just going to be the way it is, at least for the foreseeable future, if you yeah. get back. So, okay, so I'm going to do the rapid fire round with you now. Okay. So are you ready? Yes. A couple of questions. So sure. now you, you have to answer your gut instinct, okay? No thinking, no okay. thinking to this, okay? Yeah, I, I've actually done uh, done a couple of these. A couple of these, before, okay. They're fun, yeah. Hopefully, I've got some different questions than what you've been asked before. Okay. Okay, first one. Bollywood or Hollywood? Hollywood. Okay. Netflix or HBO? Netflix. Book or movie? Movie. What's the latest movie you saw? Oh my God, I'm, I'm not watching movies. I'm watching K-drama. Me too. I <laughs> <this> K-drama. <laughs> the one I'm watching now is called Kingmaker. Oh, I haven't seen that one. I King just saw the, I just the one called Black, which is very good on Netflix. You should watch that. Okay. I'm, uh, the, the last one I watched on Netflix was um, man, man to Man, I think. Is it yeah, Korean? Man man. Man? Yes, Korean. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Okay. Yep. Sunlight or moonlight? Sunlight. Okay, me too. Sunlight. Passenger or driver? Driver. Asian or Western food? Asian. Okay, me too. <laughs> <laughs> or Asian anytime. You know, they say you can't take the Malaysian out of, or you can't take the Malaysian out of wherever you go to. Like, whichever country I go to, after the first week, I can sort of, you know, I can try and eat their food. But yeah. after that, I will be looking everywhere to see at least a Chinese restaurant. or anything. Oh, yeah. 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 And then you'll, you'll realize, you'll realize even after a week, if you can't find anything, a cup noodle is fantastic. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people carry the sambal ole, you know, and then just to put oh, it yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, okay, autumn or spring? Autumn. I'm a spring girl. I love to see the flowers bloom. When you travel, is it an art museum or a history museum? History museum. Ah, me too. We have a lot in common, huh? Okay, final one. Okay. Space, moon, or Mars? Sorry, say that again? Space, moon, or Mars? If you had a chance, which one? You mean Mars, the planet Mars? Yes. Uh, the moon. The moon. Okay, I, yeah. would, be, I would be space. That's the part of the furthest that I would want to go. <laughs> okay, Zarina, it's been fantastic having this chat with you. I believe this is the most candid interview you've ever done. Yes, it is. Uh, so I hope you had fun as well. Yes, I have. I thoroughly enjoyed this. Wonderful chat that you've had. I think you shared a lot of very uh, salient information that I think will be very interesting as well as for young people who might want to go into a career in aviation. So thank you again so much for making the time. I know I was so lucky to catch you because you were in quarantine and we could do this. Um, thank you again for your time. Please stay safe. And once everything is okay, either you come to KL and we go for dinner or I'll come oh. to dinner and we'll do something then. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. You stay, stay safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.